If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Hi, I'm Stephen, and I've got a few minutes now just to unpack uh, those precious words of Jesus for us. These are words that Jesus spoke a couple of thousand years ago to his followers, to his disciples. And they're words that he wants to speak to us today. And they're they are timeless and ageless and profound and powerful. And uh, it'd be great just to invite the Holy Spirit right now, just to highlight things to each one of us, uh, for us here in the room, for you uh, there at home or wherever you are uh, listening to this. So let me just pray for us uh, before we get into these words. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the words that it contains. Uh, words of love, words of revelation about the kind of God that you are and the relationship that you are calling us into with yourself, as well as your plan for how we're to relate to others as well. And God, I just want to pray, Holy Spirit, by your power, would you highlight, would you illuminate different things for different ones listening, that we might be helped to worship you more fully, that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. We might live lives that uh, uh, display your glory and uh, your wonderful gospel to the world around us too, as well, we pray. Just right now, just, would you just grab a hold of each person's heart and uh, mind and let us hear from you today, we pray. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. I love the book of Matthew, and it's great to be in that today. Uh, but it's actually, we've been going through it really the whole month of January because uh, we've just restarted, refreshed our Bible plan. And so you can find it at wearemanual.com forward slash Bible. And uh, that's a way, as, as a community, we just travel through the Bibles together. No, no, yes, it's good to look at it on a Sunday, uh, but we really want to be fed by it. Uh, day in, day out. And so you can join in with that plan if you haven't already. And uh, you can also track with our daily devotions on our YouTube channel uh, each and every day. Different people from across our locations here as Emmanuel uh, teach us, unpacking it together. Let me encourage you to do that. But these words today in Matthew 18, they're all about the theme of reconciliation and uh, how to deal with offence, how to forgive one another. And uh, this is an issue that all of us, all of us, have to face. It's a universal issue for humanity. And so that's because uh, God, in his wisdom, has made us different people, different individuals with different passions and desires, different inclinations, uh, different kind of characteristics and makeup, different cultural backgrounds and upbringings. And so when those things come together, it can be something that is beautiful, something that is wonderful, something that helps us kind of overcome problems and obstacles and create new things. But it can also be the cause of all kinds of strife as we misunderstand one another or uh, there's missed expectations. You know, all kinds of things can creep in. That means our relationships are difficult. Uh, that uh, we kind of can fall out and we can need reconciliation. And of course, if we add, add to that the fact that each of us have sinful tendencies as well. The Bible tells us that each of us has things inside of us, motives that are wrong. Things that we say, think and do that are wrong day in, day, day out. That affect the way that we relate to one another. It says in James chapter 4, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. All of us at times may get into fights or quarrels, may not think about murder uh, right now, but we definitely have different ways in which we feel let down by others or just full on offended by other people. 
and our relationships get impacted. This is true at all times and all places and including within the church. Shock, horror. It's not a perfect place full of perfect people. No, it's a place full of imperfect people who are welcoming the grace of God. That's what we need. And uh, I just want to dedicate this message to the people that have helped me to understand these verses. I'm on church staff, so a little uh, wave. If you're a member of church staff, give me a wave. Thanks so much. Uh, if you are a member of my friend or family, a friend, friend, member of my family or a friend of mine, give me a wave. So I say thank you so much because I've had to forgive all of you at some point. You have caused me great offence at times and I have had to learn to forgive. You've, had to, you've made these verses really real to me. So just thank you for that. But of course, I need to give you a wave as well because I've done the same for you. I've taught you as I've offended you, if I've misspoken or just blatantly let my selfishness or my pride spill out and splash against you. And you've learned how to, to learn as well how to deal with my offence. And we've had to learn together how to reconcile with one another. And I love these verses. These lovely, these very, very practical verses from Jesus teach us how to navigate our relationships. And really is navigating. How do we journey through these difficult moments? And uh, these verses are just so, so super practical. I said to the team this week, I must use them every week in some way with someone to help them uh, deal with the issues that they're facing. But before we look at these practical kind of, I want to give some tips, really nuts and bolts stuff today. Before we get there, I just want us to look and the fact that uh, reconciliation, this theme, is not just about kind of wisdom for us, but really is uh, uh, foundational to the Christian faith. It's right at the heart of the Christian faith, right at the heart really of who Jesus is. And uh, last week, Joel spoke to us about the fact that people who love us say hard things to us at times. Genuine love is not just characterised by saying nice things. It's often saying the hard thing to one another. And before Jesus proclaimed the good news of reconciliation, he had to proclaim to us the bad news and the fact that each of us are offensive to God. And maybe that's news to you today. But all of us, in the way that we've acted, the different thoughts and uh, different things we've said or different things we've done, they are offensive to God. They fall short of God's holy standard. They fall short of uh, how we should worship him. He deserves our worship and love. But so often we uh, misplace our worship, put it in different directions, or we love ourselves more than him. And this, well, this causes relational breakdown. As with all offence in life, our offence against God causes a chasm to appear. And when it comes to God, it's a cosmic chasm. One that we then can't cross one that we can't bring back together. There's a barrier there that is too strong for us to be able to deal with. We are in need of someone to come and help us with it. We're in need of a mediator. And that's Jesus' message to us. That's, uh, kind of a, maybe that's a new message for you this morning, that you need to be right with God. The great thing about the God that we worship is that he knows our frame. He knows our weakness. He knows our sinfulness. He knows we're helpless and harassed. And uh, he came into the world. He left heaven, came to us to help us become reconciled with God, to come and absorb the offence of our sin upon the cross so that we could be forgiven, that he could offer forgiveness to everyone who humbly admits that they need it, humbly admits that they need Jesus, so that, what? So that we can be reconciled with God. That is the good news for us today. Each of us can be reconciled, that the things we've done, the relationship we've broken with God can be mended, can be fixed. That's incredible news, incredibly good news. That's what Christianity is about. That's what the church is about. That's why Emmanuel exists. We exist to help people find their way back to God. We exist to help people be reconciled to God. We're here so that people can overcome their offence and find their way back to him. And Jesus and the Bible, well, he take, they take the kind of reconciliation very, very seriously, crazy seriously. And in these verses, yes, we're going to look mostly at our interpersonal relationships and how we navigate them. But we can't skip over the fact that Jesus says in these passages that you've got to take a reconcil reconciliation seriously if you're going to be part of the church. Because if you don't, you need to be put out of it, which sounds pretty strong. Uh, but that's how God feels about it. Being reconciled people, being uh, unified, being full of love, being peacemakers is a massive part of who we are as Christians. 
It's fundamental to uh, the family that God brings us into. And if we abandon that, we reject that, we don't receive that, we don't want to enter into it, and Jesus says, well, you can't really be part of it. If you're not willing to play by the rules, as it were, well, actually, you can't be part of the game anymore. You have to be put out. And so at times, as elders, as an elder here, we have to you know, help people say, you know, you're not entering into reconciliation. You're not looking at your sin seriously. And so unfortunately, we have to say, you, you can't be part of the church anymore. I have to take it to the church, which is pretty serious and uh, difficult. And we do that patiently. And we take that slowly. And uh, I'd love to talk more about that. In fact, we are going to talk a bit more about, bit more about that at Live Brunch. So why don't you join us a bit later? I think that'll probably help the views today. And, uh, and takes it seriously. But Jesus goes even further than that. Jesus, and, that's, and so when we put people out, we don't just put them out and, and abandon them. No, we do that so that they might feel the seriousness of it. And maybe they might repent and we can restore them. But Jesus goes even further than that. Later in Matthew 18, Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. In response to one of the disciples, Peter says, how often should we forgive? How often should we reconcile? He's like, let me tell you how often. And he tells this story about a king who uh, uh, offers forgiveness to a servant who owed him an incredible amount. And uh, this king lets him off, forgives him this amazing debt. And that's a picture of us and God. And God's amazing forgiveness that he offers us. But then the story goes on to where this uh, servant doesn't forgive his fellow servant who has a kind of a meagre uh, issue with him. Uh, but he, he goes to town and he's totally unforgiven, uh, has total unforgiveness in his heart towards him. And uh, Jesus speaks with really strong language, quite honestly with damning language towards them. And says, you know what? You cannot be one who harbours unforgiveness and be part of the people of God. This isn't just wisdom, it is wisdom. It is relational wisdom, but it's more than that. It is a command to be like Jesus. If you want the family likeness, well, we are those who are to grasp hold of reconciliation and forgiveness with all that we have, with all that we have. This is God's priority and we want to enter into it. We want to be like him. We've got something, we've got this great message to tell the world. We've got this wonderful thing that we can demonstrate, a great hope to hold out to other people. It says in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. The Son of God was a peacemaker. The Son of God was a reconciler. That's who Jesus is. And we can be like him. We can be blessed and be like him. We can be those who can be peacemakers. Make peace where there's currently strife and offence. But that's not always our natural inclination. In fact, it's not any of our natural inclination to be like that. We don't naturally want to make peace. No, we don't deal with offence and forgiveness that well. We need help with this. And... Uh, there can be kind of a spectrum of people. There can be those who just kind of cover up and ignore offence and just try and hope it goes away or just kind of put them in a place where they haven't got to look at it. There's others who, when they're offended, just go full tilt in terms of offending back and wanting to blow it up. Cover up and blow it up. But we're not to be either end of the spectrum. We're going to chart a course in the middle of that with God's help to be those who bring it up with love and grace. So we're going to look at those different options and we're going to find some guiding principles to help us to work out how to deal with conflict. And there's just two very clear ones. In the way that we deal with other people and deal with our offence, are we glorifying God? In the way that we deal with other people, do, are we glorifying God? Would God get glory with the way we speak and deal with others? And the other one is, are we loving other people? Are we loving the person in front of us? And love doesn't always just look like being nice. Sometimes love means saying painful things as we learned last week. But are we glorifying God? Are we loving people? So let's have a look at this spectrum. Let's start with the one that I most like. Okay, maybe you can guess which way uh, do I fall? Well, I go this way. I blow up. That's the way I'm like. When I'm offended, you know, I'm a passionate person. I feel things deeply and I express them full-heartedly. And so when it's negative, when it's difficult, I'm more likely to blow up. I'm more likely to tell you exactly what I think. I'm much more likely to confront things. I don't hold back. I'm quite happy to confront things. Too happy in reality. But, um, and, but it's not always a blowing up. I don't often shout, don't often rage. It comes out in different ways. It comes out in little sideways comments, little passive aggressive moments, or just twist the knife and other things, or get my own back, or find a way to even the score, that kind of thing. But this kind of response to offence is like throwing a grenade in. Where there's already difficulty, where I've already been offended, a relationship has maybe just broken a little bit. When we blow up, when we kind of come back at the people, what do we do? We like to throw a grenade into it. We just blow those parts further apart. 
That's what it does. And it's not that we shouldn't be angry at points in our life. The Bible is very clear. Actually, anger is really appropriate. When we see injustice, when we see um, unrighteousness, that should kind of stir up some emotion in us, negative emotion. But the Bible also warns us. It's very difficult to be angry and not sin. It's very difficult to um, uh, be offended and express your offence to other people without sinning against them. And uh, we're reminded that I mean, whatever we do, we need to glorify God. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And it's very difficult to make side race comments or be passive aggressive or be grumpy or shout at someone and still glorify God. I think if Jesus was sitting next to me, would he have appreciated the way I spoke to my children then? Was that, was that a good way? Did I glorify him in my actions? And it's very difficult to love someone if you're raging against them. Maybe if you're like me, maybe you're that end of the spectrum. Maybe that's the way that you would naturally be inclined. Well, I found these verses very helpful in uh, Philippians 4, a long time ago, when I was kind of grapp- grapp- grappling with this side of my character. It says, uh, let your gentleness be evident to all. Or another translation says, let your reasonableness be evident to all. Would people say to you that you're gentle and you're reasonable when you're offended? Even in those moments, are you like that? That's, what about, that's blowing up. We went down the other end of the spectrum, covering it up. There's others who, when it comes to being offended or there's difficulties in a relationship, what do they do? Well, they want to try and ignore it or quieten it or just just, just kind uh, kind of hide it away. Well, that's not God's way either. Because the reality is when we do that, what we do instead is we uh, just uh, uh, let bitterness grow inside our hearts. It can be like weeds in a garden, untended to, that begin to grow and encapsulate our hearts. Or it becomes a lens in which you look at relationships through. And uh, if one end is like a grenade blowing up relationships, well, this is more like a stealth killer. You know, just stealthily getting in there, destroying relationships, causing coldness to set in, hardness of heart to set in causing relationships to drift. Instead of dealing with things, instead of making up with someone, we said we just ignore it. And maybe just begin to ignore the relationship. And that's can what be what happens instead. But again, this is not how Jesus deals with us. When we offended God, he didn't just turn his back on us. He didn't just see the anger in heaven and say, okay, well, they've offended me. They've not worshipped me as they should. They've not acted towards me as they should. So I'm just going to ignore them. He didn't just abandon us into our sin. no. He comes out of his comfort zone and comes to us. Comes to meet us in our offence to him. Comes. And that takes courage. That takes hard work. That takes being in the uncomfortable place. Some of us are comfortable with confrontation. Others, we hate it and we want to run from it. But as God's people, we should be those who go into that uncomfortable place and deal with things properly. The reality is in lockdown, some of us have been thrown into households where suddenly you're living uh, in close quarters with people day in, day out, and that can cause all kinds of difficulties. Others of us, we're loving it. We're not having to see people as much as we used to. We're not having to reconcile as much as we used to. I spoke to a friend this week who has a kind of a, I think it's fair to say, an ongoing issue with another one of our friends. They're just a bit, they're chalk and cheese. They, don't, you know, they often don't get on with one another and it takes a lot of grace and, and bless them, both really good at leaning in. And I just asked them, how's that going? They're like, yeah, it's going all right. I don't see them. I was like, oh, good point. Actually, sometimes it's easy to navigate relationships when we just don't see each other. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe she just doesn't see anyone. That would deal with it. Although that brings other issues. Now that doesn't solve the issue of the heart. I remember there was someone in the church who sinned against me who quite honestly really, really offended me. And uh, I was really quite cross with them. But eventually the, the crossness kind of subsided. I think I did some measure of uh, asking God and, and forgiving them with, with God. Didn't, didn't really speak to them about it particularly. And I thought, oh, I just could, can I, someone asked me about it. I think, yeah, I think that's all dealt with. And uh, we're, we're a multi-site church here at Emmanuel. It means we meet in different locations. And uh, the person who offended me went to another location. And uh, one Sunday I went to worship at that location and they were there. And uh, as I was worshipping, the band played, were playing, I looked across the room and I saw that person, hands in the air, worshipping God, enjoying his love and joy. And I was like, oh yes, there they are, worshipping Jesus with joy on their face, knowing his love. And Jesus better love them because Jesus is the only one who possibly could. I was like, ah, something might be wrong here. I think maybe I haven't forgiven them. I've just forgotten them. I've not seen them. And there's a danger that we think we've dealt with something. We haven't. We've just ignored it. We've just buried it. And suddenly there's a moment where it comes to the fore. 
And in that service, I had to do some business with God. I'd say to him, you know what, God, I'm now in the wrong. They wronged me, but I'm now in the wrong because I'm harboring unforgiveness to them. And God, I said, God, help me with my unforgiveness. Forgive me for my unforgiveness that I might then forgive them. So covering up isn't right necessarily. Now, some of you will know your Bible and say, but the Bible tells us something. It says this in 1 Peter 4. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. The reality is when we're offended in day to day, we want to actually cover most of it with love. There's little difficulties, little words that are said wrong, miscommunications, where actually we want to think the best. We want to love people, cover it in a way that says, you know what, I can have grace for that person. I can just absorb whatever's happened there. But love, covering it, isn't always the way. That is, that is what I want to encourage you to do. Maybe that's, you need to do a bit more of that. But there are times where covering it's not right where it's put you out of relationship, where you are personally dealing with it. Or maybe, out of love, you're spotting a pattern in that other person's life. That you know what? It's going to take courage to bring up. But for their good, because you love them, because you want to become more like Jesus, you want to raise it. And that's really right and really appropriate. That's what kind of Jesus is encouraging here. He's saying, if someone sins or sins against you, go to them. Go to them by yourself and speak to them. And that's where we're moving into now. Bring it up. Not... Blowing up about it, not just covering it up, but bringing it up with the person. And uh, Jesus just gives some really practical ways in which we do this. And when Jesus say bring it up, he said, you know, bring it up with the person, bring it up alone. Often when we are offended, we do bring it up, but not with the person. We bring it up with everybody else. We're like, well, this person's offended. I'll just check in. What do these other people think about that? Maybe I can garner some support for my sense of self-pity. And have a, you know, a pity party is not fun unless other people are involved. So we involve other people in our offence. She said, don't do that. That's not God. That's not how we do that. No, we take it to God. You know what that is? That's gossip. The Bible speaks against her. Don't gossip. Not in the family of God. That does not help reconciliation. That helps um, disunity. That helps break things apart. If you've got an issue, what do you do? You take it to God and you take it to the person. That's difficult at times. But that's the way we to do it. And um, how do we do that? Well, let me give you some top tips. We do it prayerfully. When someone's offending me, you know what? The first thing I do, I want to pray about it first before I do anything else. Because it may be that I can just cover it in love. It may be that God, how we do it. And if I do it, help me to do it with humility. And uh, help me to do it because I love that person rather because I love myself. Not just because I'm offended, but because I want to be reconciled. I want to be like you, Jesus. And I want to go to that person like you came to me, God. And so I want to go to the person. I want to leave as little delay as possible. Now, those who blow it up, we want to deal with it straight away. Let's do it. And those who have a natural inclination to covering up, we want to wait to the right time. We'll put it off as long as possible. And there's some kind of midpoint there where we give it a bit of time, maybe just to settle it in our own heart. But we don't let it go too long where uh, we don't deal with it properly. Now we go to people and speak to them about the things that are wrong. And we do it with humility. I think often that looks like just by going with questions and by some sense of second guessing what you see. I think there's times where there again someone else offended me and uh, it'd been a bit of a pattern over a number of months, different ways they've been treating me. And uh, again, I just prayed and went to them and just really said, I want to talk to you about something. Um, I'm feeling offended by this thing you've been doing, uh, but I know that it might be me. Maybe there's some oversensitivity in me or difficulty that, that, that I'm facing. But I want to bring it into the light because I want to be on the same page with you. And right now, I don't feel like that. I feel a bit grumpy towards you. And I, everything you do, I'm looking through a lens of you offending me. And I don't want to live in that place. So how can I bring it to you? And so that person, as we brought it into light, just said, you know what? They, they held their hands up and said, you know what? You're right. That's wrong. And it's not just you. Actually, I've been like that with other people as well. Please forgive me. Please help me as I deal with that. And uh, I've had to do it the other way. I've had to invite other people into a situation. A couple of Christmases ago, it was the end of a, an autumn term, and me and my wife, had a, it was busy. And uh, we both got into Christmas and thought, we had this expectation that we were going to love and serve one another. Help me, I've had a busy term. Love me. We both were coming from that point of view, just kind of looking to the other person to meet all our relational needs. And that didn't go well. And uh, we had this argument and we fell out. And, uh, uh, but thankfully we said, look, we're not getting anywhere in this argument. Let's just be okay with one another. Let's pray together and let's go to bed. We'll talk about it again tomorrow. So next day we woke up and we've got a cup of tea, sat down at our kitchen table together. So let's just talk about this again. And boy, did it go badly. 
If the day before had been bad, this was like, oh no, it's gone nuclear. It's not gone well. And uh, it just went really, really badly. And uh, my wife, who is a godly woman, Emma says to me, she says, I think, I think we need, might need some help with this. Why don't you ask your brother to come round and just help us walk this through? And I said to her, well, I was thinking about it, but now you've suggested it, I'm definitely not doing it. And my immaturity just spilled out. But eventually I thought, you know what, she's right. And so I invited my brother Paul round. He just came and just sat with us. And uh, like it says there in the passage, two or three people together, we got in the midst of us, just saying, God, help us work this out. And we just, we were helped and we were helped through and found each other in that moment. It's such a wonderful privilege to be called into those situations. Like I said, I use this verse all the time. People come to me with all kinds of different offences that are happening in the church. I've helped friends deal this, week, this year with the issue of race. It's been really at the forefront, working out how they navigate that. Help business people who are kind of closing down a business, but it's fraught with all kinds of anxiety and difficulty, but just learning how to lead in and be generous. Help marriages get back on track. Families come together as we apply these principles uh, into our relationships. Time and time again, we've got great hope. There's no difficulty, no relationship is too far gone for the gospel to be applied to. We were, had a cosmic chasm with God that Jesus was able to come and fill by his work at the cross. That's the same with our relationships with one another. Because of Jesus, because of what he did at the cross, we can have hope that our relationships can come back together. Today's message will be hard for some of you to hear because you'll be recognising, yes, there's some patterns of behaviour that aren't good, but you'll also be recognising there's some relationships right now that are not right. They're not good. And maybe you're feeling like they are too missy. They are too far gone. I want to say to you, that is not true. That is the lie of the enemy. He wants to say, yes, there's disunity and that's just the way it's going to be. That's not what God was saying. God was saying there is hope for restoration as we go to people, as we invite other people into our situations, that we can chart a course forward that brings God glory, that loves the people in front of us and brings reconciliation. Blessed are peacemakers because they should be called sons of God. Let me encourage you this week. Why don't you go and make peace? Go and find moments this week to reach out to other people and make a way.